Hi guys, I am in Dubai. So uh, Dubai is sort of like the almost halfway home mark for me of a very long trip. So I have uh, just gone from uh, Copenhagen, which was, I think it was yesterday. <laughs> it was Thursday, I went from Copenhagen uh, over to London and then uh, changed airports and went for all changed terminals. Went from London to Dubai and now I've got only like 13 hours or something of flying left until it's done. Uh, so for those of you who are not aware, Australia is on the other side of the world to absolutely everything, which is just fantastic. And as you can probably hear, I've got a little bit of a cold as well, uh, and I've just come down from altitude and my ears are a little bit funny, so everything sounds kind of weird to me. But uh, other than that, it's all gone really well. So uh, a number of really interesting things, for me at least, happened this week. I passed the 1 million verified subscriber mark on Have I Been Pwned, which is yeah, I, th I think that is mostly a positive thing. It's, I'm always a little bit cautious when I pass a milestone with data breaches. It's like, well, it's a nice number, but did we really want to see everything get owned? Uh, I'm much more positive about reaching a milestone of verified subscribers because it's nice to know that there's that many people that are interested in the service and interested in their own, uh, well, I guess, their own exposure online. So, past a million. Uh, Excellent news. <laughs> I said verified as well. So that is they have uh, gone to the site, entered their email address, they have received an email, they've clicked on the link in the email to say that they actually wanted to opt in to the, to the uh, monitoring. So good news on that front. I've got a lot of stuff in mind for Have I Been Pwned this year uh, on a number of different fronts. So it'll be interesting to see how that pans out. So there was that. Uh, I have just left Denmark uh, via London due to the, the joy of flight routing. And I had a really good week in Denmark. So I did a talk uh, for a company on Monday. In fact, I did a whole day of talks, day of talks and questions and things like that, which was really good fun, uh, <laughs> mostly. Other than, as I tweeted during the week, it was the first time I had accidentally ended up with hardcore porn on the screen during a presentation to, I don't know, a hundred something people in a corporate environment. Fortunately, they were very cool with it insofar as they all thought it was hilarious. Um, mostly at seeing the, uh, I think, probably the shock that, that I had. The, the context for those who are wondering, no, it wasn't a bookmark or history or anything like that. It was the Tor browser, it was browsing through a dark web marketplace because someone had said, can you show us how people are trading data and how they're selling data? So I was like, yeah, look at this, it's really interesting. You go in here and there's the cocaine and there's the MDA and there's the, you know, all the other drugs and stuff like that. And then over here, there'll be the data, oh crap. <laughs> so I'll tell you what, I've never minimized a window so quickly. Uh, and I have uh, learned an interesting thing there. So I think I may go off mirroring just whilst I find the right page in dark web websites if I get a request like that in the future. So anyway, that was Monday. Uh, Tuesday, Wednesday, I did another uh, open workshop or public workshop, uh, courtesy of the uh, Copenhagen.net user group. I did one for them in October as well, uh, and they both went fantastically, both very well attended events. Everyone seemed to be very happy with those. And then yesterday, I think yesterday, <laughs> I think yesterday was Thursday. It's it a bit funny when you travel. Uh, I think it's Thursday, I did a talk at Microsoft as well. So I went over to Microsoft in Copenhagen. Uh, they had a, a, a big room there where they got a bunch of people from Microsoft uh, to come down and, and have a listen to my talk, as well as a bunch of people from outside. It was, a, it was available to, to anyone who wanted to attend, which was fun. So I did my same security talk that I did in, in London, my new something something security talk, uh, which was a lot of fun. And it was a bit more of a casual environment and we had a lot much longer. So I, I kind of went off on tangents and uh, did not go to dark web websites, I must say that much, but did many other things that, that were uh, quite well received. And it was, it was interesting actually, I, uh, normally the talk would be like 50 minutes, so I embellished and it went out to an hour 20 or something. Stuck around and answered questions for about another 40, 45 minutes while everyone was there and then hung out and, and spoke to a couple of guys for a bit. And the interesting thing was, they were saying, oh, look, it's, you know, it's really nice you actually stayed around. Like, a, a lot of speakers will come and they'll, they'll talk and they'll finish and they'll go. And, uh, you know, it's, it's like you're normal. <laughs> I, was, I was thinking, I was, I was actually saying to them, it's like I remember what it was like when I was sitting there watching people come that, that I, uh, what's the right way of putting it, that, that I sort of saw as, I 
are experts, for want of a better term, and I don't really like that, like that, the idea of that term, but, you know, um, people who you looked up to. And, yeah, I remember being on the other side, and it was always so nice when people actually want to hang out and chat and, and uh, engage. And I think that that's really important. Um, plus, I was going to have to wait in an airport for hours anyway, so that also made it a bit easier. But I always try and do that anyway, because I think it's just a nice thing. And it's better than just sort of blasting in and doing your spiel and then, then disappearing. So that was kind of cool. And I guess sort of along those lines, looking back at this trip, which will be sort of three weeks end to end, uh, one of the things that, that kind of struck me the other day, and I was, I was watching a lot of the, the news because I had a bit of time to hang out in the hotel. Uh, bad idea watching the news over the last week. Uh, the international news is... is uh, we're not going to go into detail, but let's just say it is full of uh, negativity about certain political events at the moment. It, the, uh, it has uh, been very, uh, very overwhelmingly depressing to watch the news. Uh, so, a, a lighter note, uh, one thing that, that has really worked well on previous trips, and especially this trip, and I've said it before, is meeting up with Twitter people uh, in person and you know, actually doing the in real life thing. And in total on this event, uh, I met up with uh, seven different people and I'll, I'll sort of give you a bit of a rundown of, of the kinds of experiences it was. So there was, I got to London on the, on the first day and there was, there was a journalist who wanted to catch up and we had a, had a nice coffee and a chat about a bunch of things. Uh, we went and then caught up, uh, we, my mate Lars Clint and I, uh, caught up with someone who gave us a great tour through, um, uh, through Westminster Abbey. It was like the school attached to Westminster Abbey. Uh, and it was a couple of guys who were like 17 years old, they were students there, and that they tweeted me and said, hey, do you want a tour? And we had their, their computer science teacher, uh, took us through the whole school, you know, sort of very historical stuff, hundreds of year old dining halls and things like that. Took us to the robotics lab, seeing what the kids were building, which was pretty awesome. It was a really nice, positive experience. Uh, met up with a couple of, of other Twitter people uh, who were also journos a bit later on. Had another cup of coffee, very nice. Later that week, you would have seen this in my weekly update two weeks ago, went to McLaren uh, due to a, a, a Twitter follower as well, uh, which, was, which was a highlight of the trip too. It was, it was especially good. So that was good. Uh, when I was over in Belgium, met up with a couple of other different Twitter followers in Antwerp. Uh, hung out with one guy and had a nice coffee in the sun. Another bloke took me to walk around some local spots and gave me two bottles of what is allegedly the world's best beer. <laughs> now. Not just his allegedly, you look it up and it's like, yeah, this is meant to be the world's best beard. Uh, and it is somewhere in one of those planes over there in my suitcase, hopefully going to make it to the other end. So that was awesome. And then when I got to Copenhagen, I'm, I'm walking around on the street and then I sit down and have my lunch and some guy tweets me and says, oh, I think I just passed Troy Hunt. And I was like, wow, that's, that's weird when someone actually recognises you on the street. So I'm like, all right, let's go have a coffee. And that was a nice meet up too. So we caught up had uh, probably the best coffee of my entire trip too in a, in a great little spot there in Copenhagen. So all of this stuff is kind of meeting at randoms for want of a better term. Uh, people I've never met before and, and people who I've uh, maybe I've interacted with before but they've just reached out. And it was all positive experiences, good news story for my week and, and that's one of the things I remember from the trip. So that was that. Uh, I did actually do a few um, pieces of work as well. <laughs> I mean, other than the speaking and everything. So I, I pushed out a blog post that I'd wanted to do for a long time, which was about uh, HTTPS. Now, hmm, excuse me, because I am battling the jet lag as well. <laughs> so the coffee helps. The thing about HTTPS, and the reason I wanted to do this for a long time, is that the point I wrote, or rather the title of the blog post, was about HTTPS reaching the tipping point. And this tipping point, the concept of the tipping point, is, is when an idea or, 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 or a movement sort of gains enough momentum that it really starts to, to get a lot of traction and uh, take on a life of its own. And that I guess the point with HTTPS is that there's been a lot of stuff just over recent months, even just over January, uh, which has taken it to much greater heights and really started to move it along. Now there's a few things here that happen. One of them is, and the reason why I waited uh, until just now to write this post, is that Chrome 56 and Firefox 51 both now warn you if you load a login form or a payment form over HTTP, even if you post to HTTPS. 
Now I've written many things over many years about websites doing this, but the browser never really gave you a warning. It just did this whole neutral sort of security thing where you don't get a padlock to indicate it's secure and due to the absence of a secure indicator, one should assume that it is not secure. That now changes and you'll see, I'll, I'll link to this blog post, you'll see I've, I've given some examples of Qantas. That, man, that worked out funny. I'll come back to Qantas. Uh, but the examples show that when the login form loads and the page is served by HTTP, uh, in Chrome there's a big not secure up the top left. When I say big, it's next to the address bar where the padlock would normally be. And in Firefox the, there's a little padlock that then gets a cross through it. The relevancy to Qantas, as I look out at the Qantas plane I just got off, uh, is that they have been doing this for ages. And I know they've done it. I've mailed people in Qantas before and said, look, you really want to clean this up, along with a bunch of other stuff. So I thought, oh, you know what, we'll troll them a little bit. I'll just tweet them a, an image of this and go, hey, Qantas, your, uh, your website is apparently not secure. Uh, they, they suggested using another browser. They also suggested uh, manually typing in HTTPS colon forward slash forward slash, which of course any of us who are actually concerned about our, our sort of form loading and securely could do, but it's not really the point. We'd actually like them to fix it and get it right, which would be much better. So uh, look, we'll see if and when they get that sorted out. I'm just sure it's, it's a when rather than an if, but you know, they've got the certificate there already. Just fix your things, add some CSPs to upgrade insecure requests, and the whole thing would not be too much of drama. So anyway, there's that. There is the prevalence with which sites are now redirecting people from HTTP to HTTPS. Uh, and the stats I gave show uh, courtesy of my mate Scott Helm, who does lots of scans of the Alexa Top 1 million. The stats show that as of about now, 18.4% of the Alexa Top 1 million are redirecting from HTTP to HTTPS. Now that is up from I think it was about 13.4 or something uh, percent in August uh, last year and I show sort of several, he does them every six months, so show several tests uh, from periods beforehand and the, the one constant here is it looks like we're growing at sort of three to four percent of, of, the, of the top one million at least every six months uh, which is really good news so that's really rolling along. Uh, so we're seeing that happen, of course, we've got the likes of Let's Encrypt doing free certificates, Cloudflare doing the certificate thing with the CDNs and the reverse proxies and everything, also free to get into. And all of this is really accelerating the momentum of HTTPS. And there's never been a better time to go and get it. There will be a point in time in the future where if you don't have it, your browser is going to show more warnings even when there's not payment forms. Uh, Google has been very explicit many times about this happening. They won't be doing it until we get to such a critical mass that you're not continually bombarded by warnings because if you get continually bombarded by warnings, you've got another problem. So that was the HTTPS side and again, I'm very, very happy with the way that's going. Uh, go and have a look at that blog post. I am actually writing a Pluralsight course at the moment on what every developer should know about HTTPS. I've got to try and edit another module on the next uh, leg home and then hopefully I'll get the whole thing out. Uh, it's probably going to be about March. It goes live sometime in March. Now, uh, one more thing. I did my Security Sense column this week and I was talking here about the, uh, I guess ultimately the, the, the value, the ROI on investing in education for security. So we're talking about teaching people building systems about security. I clearly have a very vested interest because I do the, the plural site thing um, and I know I'm always wearing this shirt but they gave me so many of them and it makes it so easy. <laughs> I barely have to think about it when I travel. So uh, we're talking about education and I've sort of gone look like the best ROI you can get on your security spend is education because it's something which pays off over and over and over and over again. It's a lot cheaper than going out and buying a lot of security appliances. Uh, for me to go in and do a workshop for a company for like 30 people who then use that knowledge for many years to come works out about the same as doing a single pen test on, on a lot of applications. So it makes a lot of sense for companies. And when you look at the sorts of vulnerabilities we're seeing, and the sorts of simple mistakes people are making simply because they don't know the secure patterns, it's really, it's, I guess it's really obvious just how 
uneducated uh, a lot of developers are when it comes to the security side of things. And during my talks, including the talk I just mentioned I did yesterday with Microsoft, uh, one of the things I'm doing in this new talk is I'm showing this tutorial where there's a kid on, um, on YouTube and I'll, I'll try and link to it actually because it's kind of an interesting talk. I'll put it in the notes. So there's a kid on YouTube and this kid, he's probably about 15, 16 years old by the sound of his voice. He's doing this tutorial on how to use uh, Havage. So Havage being free SQL injection software. But before he gets to Havage, what he has to do is he has to find vulnerable sites. So he, he basically goes and runs a Google Doc with a query string, takes the first result, opens the website, goes up to the query string where there's an integer, puts an apostrophe such that it gets concatenated into a statement and a SQL exception thrown, copies the URL, chucks into Havage, sucks the data out. And this is crazy, right? Because this is, you know, not only highly illegal, but ridiculously simple. And in the talks I've been doing, uh, we do part of that just to demonstrate the prevalence of risks. So there's a, there's a Google Doc you can do to look for uh, query strings in PHP apps. I've been grabbing the results, grab the first four hits, and each one of those first four hits, if you put one character in, into the, uh, into the query string, one character isn't hacking. <laughs> I don't think it's hacking. We certainly don't get any useful data out with one character. One character, so just whack an apostrophe in the query string, the first four results all come back with internal SQL exceptions. So very highly likely at risk of SQL injection. The way I, I then demonstrate the, the defensive measures is I show both good and bad versions of a SQL statement within an ASP.NET application. The way I show that is I use a particular blog post that someone wrote a couple of years ago, and I'll link to that as well. And this particular blog post is about how to do a password reset in, in a web forms app. And the guy has got terribly vulnerable code in there. He's literally got one block of code which is properly parameterized SQL, and then within the same screen, just beneath that, unparameterized SQL at risk of SQL injection. And I wouldn't normally just pick someone's blog and point to it and say, hey, you know, this is bad, but you'll see when I link to it, I wrote the guy a very long message, a uh, very long uh, a comment. And I, I think I started by saying, hey, I'd just like to give you some friendly advice. And I very uh, objectively and constructively told him areas that he really needed to think about. Got ignored. Now, that was one thing. But then you'll see there's a bunch of comments afterwards where people go, this was very useful. Thank you. I have now implemented this in my website. And what's happened is people have taken this bad, bad, bad code, and by all accounts, they're now building other systems with that code and creating some pretty serious problems. So I'm using this as an example of, of what not to do, and, and I guess it's also a bit of an example of how there's a lot of information out there uh, which can be pretty bad too. So I'll link to that as well, and you'll, you'll see what I mean. Last thing is I still have... And I just realized also, I don't normally look at the screen, but my colors are going kind of crazy. And I think it's because I've got this really nice part of the building, which lets all this light in, uh, in the lounge. And for those who are interested, this is Dubai. I've never been outside the airport in Dubai. But <laughs> anyway, so sorry about the colors. I'll turn that around a bit. Uh, so last thing is Netsparker are still sponsoring my blog this week. I think this is about the third week I've had them on board. They'll be around for a little bit longer yet. Uh, again, I really like what those guys do. They do some great dynamic analysis tools. Always makes a big impact when I show Netsparker as part of my uh, workshops because people are not aware that you can actually get tools to point at applications which do find a huge number of the vulnerabilities which do exist. Now, particularly the things that are easily testable by machines. You know, SQL injection reflected cross-site scripting finds things like all the public Git repositories you've left laying around on your website. Don't do that, by the way. <laughs> it's a bad thing. And if you're unsure how many people actually do that, there are Google Docs that will show you, and it is stunningly alarming. So that is it. I have got, uh, what have I got, about an hour left to uh, chill out and, and have some coffee before my other very long flight. Uh, and then I'll get home, and I have about uh, an hour or two at home before I have to drive several hours into the countryside and go to a wedding. So I don't get much of a break. Uh, but I will then have a week off before then we've got things like Microsoft Ignite on the Gold Coast and, and more travel, but I'll get to that next week. Thanks very much for watching, guys.